This is my new Patreon series number 53. I'm going to talk about my spiritual autobiography, Sparks of Gnosis. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to my spiritual autobiography, which was written during the COVID pandemic in 2020, and uh, just show you through it and what's in the book. My spiritual autobiography, Sparks of Gnosis, visions, experiences, and relationships that guided my path in life can be purchased through Amazon and Amazon Kindle online. You can get it as, a, as an ebook for Kindle, for PC, or tablet for $9.99. You can get a free download of Kindle for PC or Mac. And you can get it as a 222-page paperback for $20. It can be purchased directly from me as a PDF file for $10 and may be purchased at my workshops as a paperback for $15. We live two lives. One is external and consists of ordinary consciousness. It has many aspects like the branches of a tree and is visible but it is limited by personality, biology, and society. But the other is internal, secret and hidden from all others and even from ourselves, like the roots of a tree. Occasionally, it enters our consciousness through dreams and vague impulses, but only when we pay attention to it and attune ourselves to its realities and seek to know the eternities that exists deeply within our true spiritual nature, do we begin to awaken to its wisdom? So instead of an autobiography, this memoir records my subjective remembrance of spiritual consciousness and knowledge as it developed and evolved through periods of my life. It's framed within the biographical context for specific dreams and premonitions and visions and relationships and the mystic experiences that constitute the most significant elements of my life. They were the memorable realities that guided me. None of us truly knows or is known except by our own souls and the mind of God. So my intention in writing Sparks of Gnosis was to revisit and contemplate the evolution of my personal spiritual history. What Dickens described as, quote, buried treasure and other things submerged. It has been a spiritual exercise, not unlike Jung's memories, dreams, and reflections, but focused upon the interior consciousness that guided my outer life. I've narrated each period of my childhood and young adulthood chronologically to examine the roots and branches of my spiritual evolution up to age 30. But after age 30 in 1971, I have narrated each separate path of experience chronologically because my most creative period was an evolutionary pathworking of various identities, parent, scholar, writer, bishop, spiritual teacher, jazz musician, orchestra conductor, sailor, and educator. These pathways interacted creatively and simultaneously with each other to accelerate my growth into more advanced spiritual realities. Now, I'm going to do a quick uh, run through of what's in the book, beginning with the first part, which are my earliest spiritual memories from 1941 to 1945 during World War II my childhood and my boyhood, uh, my invisible guides and my invisible friend, my friend God, my wanderings. Uh, I was uh, hard to keep in the yard. I was always getting free and getting over our fence and having to have the police come after me. <laughs> but uh, so I will show each section of the book with uh, a paste in from uh, the table of contents and then just quickly discuss a few points of them. First of all, I had invisible playmates when I was young that were very, uh, very real to me. Uh, my earliest one was someone I called Uh-uh. 
and I'm quoting from the book, my mother told me that as soon as I could talk, I had insisted that she buy an extra ticket on the bus for uh-uh, set an extra place at the table for meals, and an extra chair at restaurants. My mother humored me, but she was glad when uh-uh left. I dreamed night after night, right after the war was over, of being taken by fairy friends to a specific house 15 miles away from our home in North Bend, Oregon, across the bay. These were my elven friends, I called them later. They were elven creatures I called brownies at the time. I don't know where I got the term, but that's what I called them. All night long, we played in the beautiful house and gardens where they lived, and then I was brought back to my home in North Bend. I had invisible guides. One I called the wise old woman, who whispered deep wisdom into my ear. At the time, I could not understand what she said, but later in life, I'd remember fragments of it. I also had a visitation that scared the crap out of me when I was just a very young boy. This was actually during the war in Stockton, California, uh, for me, but I was too young to really understand what it was, and it scared me very much. It was not a dream. It was very real. It was a presence, so I described that. Uh, I call this my friend God. <laughs> when I was introduced to the concept of God, he became my older and wiser playmate, like, uh-uh. And I used to make bargains with God and, and set up deals where, well, I'll be a good boy for seven days if you'll help me find so-and-so and all that sort of thing. I was aware of, of God as a friend, as a reality. I was uh, very difficult to deal with because when we lived in North Bend, we had a big backyard. My father built a big fence to keep me in so I could play freely in the backyard, but I was always climbing over it and getting out. Uh, finally, my mother had to keep me on a leash when we went anywhere. Otherwise, I ran off and disappeared. Uh, and I wouldn't stay in our large backyard to play. Several times, a police were called to help find me when I disappeared. And then my dad built the fence even higher than it was. It was very high to begin with. And that didn't keep me in, so Mother had to tether me to a stake like a goat. And that worked until I figured out how to untie knots. Now, my spiritual memories of my boyhood after World War II from 1946 to 55 uh, when I entered high school uh, cover many different topics. Here are just a few of them. Uh, this is what the, the table of contents looks like, but I'm not going to comment on every one of these. I wanted to build a boat and sail to Antarctica. I, I don't know why Antarctica was such a big issue for me. Uh, even when I wrote my book uh, 50 years later, I wrote uh, my book called uh, The Astral Man. I uh, had a part of it where he went to Antarctica where he meant uh, uh, various kinds of beings that uh, were evil beings that uh, were trying to control people and the planet. But Antarctica was a very interesting theme for me. Um, I uh, like to play in a wild forest we call the park that lined the entire uh, North Bencoos Bay, Bay just behind our home. Um, and I developed my dream to build a boat and sail it out the bay into the Pacific Ocean and eventually reach Antarctica. As they say, I don't know why it was so, I was so obsessed with Antarctica. And I don't know how I knew that much about it because I was only, you know, five years old. But uh, I, I hauled out a big log in order to make myself a boat. Um, and however, I, it was just too heavy for me to, to move back to our yard 
and so I had to give up that plan. And instead, I decided I would haul another tree that was much smaller, maybe five inches in diameter or something, into our backyard and carve a sort of totem pole. And at the top of the pole, I would make the face of Jesus. I erected it in the backyard and pretended to pray to it. It was my, I guess, my first ritual uh, exercise uh, in a sort of a religious sense, a worshipful sense. My mother thought it was very well made. <laughs> uh, one time, we and my friends, when I was very young, probably five, maybe six years old or something, five years old, uh, found a dead cat. And so I decided that, that we needed to do some rituals and incantations to bring the cat back to life. So I did prayers and incantations over the cat corpse, and we put it in a, an outhouse. It was a wooden outhouse in the, in the forest in the park back there uh, where we we used to play around that area so we used it as kind of a lab and then uh, I left the cat corpse with a candle and it was slowly warming in the heat of this candle but the outhouse unfortunately after we left and went home to dinner the outhouse caught on fire and uh, then uh, we nearly got in big trouble a fire department came out and had to put out the put out the outhouse <laughs> and um, after that my friends all called me the minister. I was an early reader um, and my folks had put me into a Presbyterian Sunday school from which I don't remember really anything at all except a picture of a man up on a cross with a long pole being poked into his heart and uh, that's all I remembered about that. But I did get a little white miniature Bible that was given to me. Well, I was a very early reader. I had read the complete series of the Oz books by L. Frank Baum, which were given to me by my grandmother, and countless others. So in Sunday school, I'd been given this miniature New Testament in white leather binding that would fit into my pocket. So I took it to school every day and spent my recesses behind the school outside reading it. And uh, that's very interesting because later in life I became a biblical scholar. I really don't remember anything about what I got out of reading that little Bible. I, a man came to start a school band in North Bend, Oregon. And this would be when I think I was in fourth grade. And um, he tested all the kids for you know, uh, if they could match pitches and uh, if they had uh, a good sense of tuning things. He wanted me to play a trombone because uh, uh, I had really a very good intonation sense and I could match pitches and all that. But I didn't want to play trombone as I looked at the, the trumpets that he had for, uh, for kids to borrow and use and play in the band. Uh, I saw a sort of shiny silver light that seemed to emanate from it, and I felt a thrill. It was a very bright, blissful experience. It's still very vivid in my memory. And so I said, I, I don't want to play the trombone. I want to play the trumpet. So my mother, he said, well, we don't have any more to give out. You'll have to buy one. So we went down to a music store, my mother and I, and they didn't have any trumpets, but they had an old cornet. It's a very nice little old cornet. And uh, Olds is a brand of cornet. And my mother bought it, and that's what I started out playing. I was very involved in astronomy. I loved astronomy. I read about it all the time. I studied it. Uh, when we moved up to Portland, which I which is when I believe I was starting the fifth grade. Um, my mother uh, wanted to help me make friends, so she invited uh, a lot of the kids that were my age in my class over to the house for sort of a party and for a picnic and refreshments, and I would then give an illustrated lecture about the planets. 
That was my first attempt at teaching, and I loved it. I began to have transformative cosmological experiences at night before going to sleep because I was so uh, focused on, on astronomy and, and so on. I would lay there thinking about the enormity of the universe, and I began to experience profound awe. My extreme awe overflowed into fear, and suddenly I would duck under the covers, shivering. I had this powerful experience several times. Then I would go to sleep. Practicing the cornet was really my first spiritual discipline. Uh, I began to keep a daily cornet practice regimen of two hours every day after school and three hours on weekends. That's pretty disciplined for a kid that age. Um, this continued for several years. I got to be quite good. I entered and I won solo contests. On the back of my eighth grade graduation picture, I wrote, you only get out of your horn that which you put into it as in life today. Deep philosophy for an eighth grader, I guess. That's my eighth grade graduation picture with my signature. My high school years were very transformative from 1955 to 59. The summer after eighth grade, I uh, read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment and several others, as well as Tolstoy's War and Peace and many short stories. My mother gave me her copy of Tolstoy's Spiritual Stories and Parables that I still love. I also read Henry James and the other English authors and several American novelists. So I was often just uh, sitting out on a, a recliner in the backyard with uh, uh, some ice to crunch and uh, uh, reading, reading, reading when we first moved up there to Portland. That summer also, before we began high school, I went up to the University of Oregon music camp. And I had studied music theory my own. I had done a lot of reading and studied it. So I passed through all the music theory tests up to the highest level, which is composition. And then I also became the solo cornetist in the concert band. When I entered Beaverton High School, I uh, played the cornet for a few years, but then purchased a trumpet. My mother helped me to buy a trumpet from my teacher at that time, Jim Smith, who was a principal uh, trumpeter in the Portland Symphony. Um, I was a solo. I, I was a solo cornetist in my high school band. So even in the freshman year, I was playing uh, solos with the band and concerts. Uh, but what you did in, in, in those days is for the county and the state and, and then finally the all Northwest Orchestra and the Portland Junior Symphony, all those things um, you would, when you first came in, you were sat at the lowest level in the trumpet section, and then you could challenge your way up. A challenge was a deal where <clears throat> you'd go into a room out with, with the person who was the next highest up above you, uh, you'd go into a room where nobody could see who was playing, and then you'd each be told to play the same things, scales or arpeggios or different kinds of things. And then uh, the person that did the best on it would be uh, allowed to, be, to have, been, have won the challenge. And if you were the challenger, you got to move up. So I challenged my way up in all these sections. And county uh, bands and the state uh, bands and the all Northwest Orchestra, which was several states. That was Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, I believe. And, the, and then finally, the Portland Junior Symphony, which I, uh, I joined uh, with my girlfriend, Gail. And uh, I bought a bench trumpet, and I earned a reputation of being the top high school trumpeter in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So I was a pretty hot young player. And uh, in our high school, we had a dance band. And then there was a small version of the dance band. It was a, a seven piece group called the Swing Masters that our, uh, our band director, Al Robertson, uh, would rehearse separately 
and it was a real uh, coup to be able to get into this band because in this band there was one trumpet, one trombone, a couple of saxophones and rhythm section, and you got paying gigs almost every weekend. You went to other high schools and set up. You'd, you'd go, you'd have the key to the band room, you'd go to the band room, you'd pick up all the equipment you needed, the stands and everything else and music, and then you'd all drive out to uh, whatever high school it was and set up and get your money and play the gig, which was a high school dance, and then drive back and put all the equipment back into the band room. Really high responsibility. It was really vocational training to become a professional mu musician. So we had paying gigs in other high schools every weekend. <clears throat> I was then uh, invited by a girlfriend that I had a big crush on before I ever knew her <clears throat> to, uh, to join the, the Portland Junior Symphony. So I did that and then she and I would drive together every Thursday night for the rehearsals. That was run by a, a, a man named Jacob Avshalomov. And we actually got trust fund money sometimes to play. It was a huge orchestra. It was, uh, <clears throat> uh, there were, composers were commissioned to write and uh, new music that we would premiere. And I remember the premieres of some of the great, uh, great uh, compositions that we were allowed to premiere. I also got a gig um, in my sophomore year when I could drive, because you could drive in Oregon at, uh, alone at the age of 15 and a half, um, I got the job as the co-principal of the Portland Civic Opera Company Orchestra, uh, which was a paid position. You had to drive into town and you rehearsed and you went through the performances and uh, you had to oversee rehearsals of the pit orchestra. And we rehearsed on, in Portland on weeknights and performed on weekends. Uh, the other principal, I was a principal, one side of the band, which was, you know, the trumps and trombones and brass and the timpani and so on. And then the other side was all the strings. And the principal there was a woman named Mavis, Mavis Ornstrom. She was a gorgeous uh, person, a violinist, but a gorgeous, really beautiful lady. And um, she and I uh, got together and uh, uh, we learned how to, to neck in the drive-ins <laughs> drive and she taught me how to French kiss. And uh, anyway, that was a great experience um, back in the days of the Civic Opera. And then I got jazz and jazz gigs in Portland. Um, there was a fellow named Jan Stan George uh, who had a band at the same high school that Mavis belonged to, which was way across Portland, the other side of town. And through her, I was invited by students at her high school to join this new dance band they were rehearsing and getting lots of gigs. And so I now had gigs not only from the Swing Masters, but I had them also in Portland. I got to meet and know a whole lot of Portland musicians. And... Uh, my my resume went far and wide at that point. I still know Stan. We we communicate. I used to go to the black clubs. The main one was the, called the Cotton Club, and I would jam there. I would sit in and uh, learn from the, a really great black trumpet player named Bobby Bradford. Just would just listen to him and then we would jam <clears throat> and learned a lot of stuff. And um, I also played at a place called The Way Out that was uh, uh, under the Burnside Bridge. And so I'd go there and jam. And I got to be pretty good. I was getting known as a pretty good jazz musician by this point in my life. And this was age 17 uh, and 18 and so on. Now... <laughs> When I was, I believe, 17, I was driving a friend of my sister's home. I'd been asked to drive her home. She was visiting over the weekend. My sister was not yet in high school. She was, I think, in eighth grade. So was her friend. Uh, 
I think her, I think her name was Kathy Gillespie, but I don't, I'm not sure. But we were driving on the Bertha Beaverton Highway, which was a uh, uh, a big highway for those days. It was a four lane highway. And I suddenly saw a huge airship floating above and just ahead of us. And it was amazed. I called the girls in the back seat to come up and look out the windshield and pulled over to the side of the road. We were all just transfixed by the sight. It was like almost we were time passed and we didn't even know how much time passed. Now the airship was no more than a few hundred feet above us, maybe a football field like or something. And it was drifting slowly to the north. We were headed west. It had a huge cigar shaped silver metallic fuselage about 300 yards long and two others on each side connected by several tubes, something like a trimaran. I, I took this picture off the internet trying to find some description of a cigar shaped uh, UFO. Uh, but so I didn't draw that picture, but uh, <laughs> that would probably is the closest thing to it. Uh, there were rows of lights around all three fuselages. Uh, when we went home, my we told my parents about it, my sister and I, and they, and they put us in separate rooms and said, draw what you saw. And we drew what we saw, and we both drew exactly the same thing. Um, that night, I dreamed about a beautiful tree on a grassy hill. I stood next to it, and then a, a person approached me. I don't remember a gender, but it was a friendly presence. And it stood several feet away and communicated telepathically. I don't remember what was communicated, then turned and walked away. So that was uh, an experience I had. I had other experiences also. This is when we had moved up to Portland. Uh, out my bedroom window, I saw a huge green comet streaking towards the west and uh, had some very interesting dreams after that. Now, the most significant relationship I had that I ever developed in my uh, young life was uh, my first girlfriend. For my first, not more than just a girlfriend, she was uh, the, 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 my, I, I thought, my soulmate and my, uh, uh, the woman I was going to be with. So we, we, she was a uh, very popular in high school. She was uh, uh, part of that very popular set, but she was also a violinist and she played in the orchestra. And her, her father had been my eighth grade teacher and I had first seen her one time when she came to sit in the class that her father was teaching, the eighth grade class. And she had to sit on a little chair up in front by herself because there was nobody home to babysit her and it was a holiday or something. So he had her come to the classroom and I remember being absolutely stunned by her looking at her. Uh, I don't have a, a decent picture of her. This is something I finally swiped out of a yearbook uh, uh, photo that you had to pay a lot of money to get it per, if you wanted it. <laughs> and so I just decided to use this photo. But we fell in love uh, when we started uh, going together. She was one who invited me to play with the Portland Junior Symphony. And so I would drive us over there every Thursday night. And she ditched her current boyfriend. And we spent our junior and senior years as a couple walking together and holding hands between classes. After dance gigs late at night, I would drive to her house, knock on her bedroom window, and we whispered together sometimes for hours. We were secretly engaged and I bought her a small diamond engagement ring from a pawn shop that she kept in her bedroom. We planned to get married after college and she was accepted at Juilliard and I was accepted at USC, but she planned to live at home for a while after graduation. We would talk by phone every night when I went to Los Angeles. Well, I left for USC in Los Angeles in September and the reason I went there uh, rather than going to a music conservatory, was that I wanted to study to become a lawyer so that I could support us when we got married. Um, and I left my trumpet behind. I didn't bring my horn with me when I went. Um, uh, 
so I left in September, but I left my trumpet behind and wanted to focus on pre-law classes and become a lawyer so we could get married. And I wrote to her and called several times a week as we planned. But after a month of separation, she stopped answering letters and wasn't home for the phone calls that we had scheduled. And when I returned for Thanksgiving, she gently broke up with me. As a result, I spiraled into a deep depression and disillusionment with life that lasted for several years. This was sort of my joyless dark night of the soul. After Thanksgiving, I took my binge trumpet back to USC with me, but no matter how I practiced, I was never able to get my range and endurance back to the level I had before I left for college. I was just too depressed, I think. So there's a, a period of time after age 30 that uh, that I have to I have to follow each pathway separately chronologically. Uh, but before that, uh, there was an awful lot of experience that I had from the time I was uh, college age till I was about 30. And I call it rites of passage before 30. And then at age 30, there are many pathways and path workings that I went through. So these are from my uh, The, the book's uh, table of contents. I'm going to put them all out here. Um, this whole section is quite long. I talk about my use of psychedelic drugs and all the jazz musicians I knew and uh, the sort of Jesus experiences I had uh, during that period. I, I got busted and went to jail and had to go to, I was on probation initially for five years and was finally, finally let off earlier. Um, very significant person was a priest for me over at St. Mark's Church in Portland where I was married in a shotgun wedding with, uh, with my first wife. Um, after which I applied uh, to the Episcopal Church for become a seminarian. So we spent a year in Canada where I was at the Anglican Theological College and then we went to Boston where I was at the Episcopal Theological School, ETS, which became the Episcopal Divinity School and now has merged with a, a major seminary in, in, in New York. And then I got a job as an acting assistant professor at UCSC in Santa Cruz and uh, one very important experience that came out of that was a huge festival that I was asked to put together. We call it the Festival of Porcus Mundi, the World Pig. I was very involved in radical politics at that time uh, and um, anti-Vietnam stuff and all kinds of things. And I used to go shooting out at the Chabot Gun Club with Black Panthers. Huey Newton was a friend. There's a whole lot in there that I'm not going to go through right now. Um, finally, I, I was divorced from Anne, the woman I'd uh, had the shotgun wedding with. And, um, and then finally, uh, after that divorce, and I'd been through this whole kind of dark night of the soul thing, uh, including a, a, a period of time where I nearly died from overdose of drugs and things. I had a, a wonderful experience that sort of initiated the beginning of the happiest and most creative decades of my life. And in those, those periods, I have to talk about chronologically each separate branch. So I will talk about uh, my domestic partnership with Tess Popper, which was written up in a textbook by the woman who was uh, then the president of San Jose State University. I met Mother Jenny. She became my spiritual teacher. Uh, very interesting things around the death of Mother Jenny. Uh, I uh, worked with uh, <clears throat> people to found the Academy of Arts and Humanities because I lost my job as a acting assistant professor of humanities at UCSC because um, 
at that time, there was um, a big push uh, by the government for uh, because all the university uh, positions were held by white males, mostly white and male. And so the college funding uh, by the government uh, demanded that they hire black people and uh, uh, minorities and women and so on. And um, uh, as a result, I didn't get rehired. And I, uh, I was unemployed. I made money playing with Jake Stock and the Abalone Stompers. And I went all over the country applying for administrative jobs because you just couldn't get a teaching job if you were white at that point. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so with uh, Axel Dewey, who was a, a brilliant man and his Filipino wife and his uh, other German partner and, and his Filipino wife, uh, we founded what was called the Academy of Arts and Humanities. And uh, that was a very significant thing because that's how I met uh, Bishop Spruitt and eventually uh, left the Episcopal Church and became an independent uh, bishop. Um, and then uh, I founded Popper Kaiser School with my now ex-wife, uh, Tess Popper. And I have quite a, a long description about how we tested to find the students that we needed, etc. During that period, I also was invited to be part of a uh, a group uh, up at the university to uh, be on a panel, a discussion panel with uh, Cal Thomas, who was kind of the, uh, let's just say the gunslinger, the guy who was supposed to be able to convert uh, college level kids to uh, the moral majority that was run by uh, um, Jerry Falwell and people like that. He's he's dead now. His son is the big shot now. But uh, <clears throat> I had a debate with Gal Thomas, and I absolutely fried him. I had learned how to uh, be a real heavy-duty debater when I was doing um, in Boston when I was doing my uh, Boston State Mental Hospital summer uh, internship. And there was a really nasty guy who ran the program, sort of a Southern Baptist Freud, who felt that his job was to uh, totally uh, crush in <laughs> the spirit of the, uh, of the students who came there from divinity school. Um, anyway, I had learned how to be quite a nasty debater at that point. Uh, now I go through another whole branch of my life, my boats I've had. I think 12 boats, a couple of power boats and mostly sailboats since uh, about 1980. And they were a really important a lot, part of my life. They still are. And um, so I became quite a good sailor. I, I eventually got my captain's license and so on. Uh, I had a very uh, interesting, I've only put things in this book that are part of my, what I call sparks of gnosis. They, significant things that occurred. So it's not uh, all, all over one subject. But I was uh, working as an assistant minister at uh, an Episcopal church in Capitola on Sundays with a, uh, with John Whiston, who was an Episcopal uh, priest. Uh, his father had been a very really famous Episcopal priest. And um, the point he was having an affair with a graduate student girl from history of consciousness, which I also taught in, in that program. And, um, and, uh, anyway, the point is he finally inadvertently committed suicide. His idea was to uh, look, make it look like he tried to commit suicide in order to get sympathy from his wife. But she came back from a party a lot later than he thought. And he had, he had died by that time. And so I had a visitation and from him and had to help him uh, break free and ascend. Uh, Rafi and his cello, there's a well of very interesting things that occurred with that uh, and his uh, 
choosing the cello and his developing it and becoming what he is today, one of the top cellists in the uh, in the world. And my my part in that. And uh, at a concert of Yo-Yo Ma in San Francisco at the uh, Opera House, uh, I saw, I had a visitation, an after-death visitation from my first sweetheart, Gail. And I have described that event at that time. Then I had a precognitive dream about the Loma Prieta earthquake that would happen in 1989. That, uh, that not only got me to preemptively buy uh, home insurance, earthquake insurance, which most people didn't have at that time, that actually provided about $100,000 worth of repairs to our home up in the Boulder Creek area, but uh, also just described in, in a synopsis all the things we experienced during that, during the earthquake and after the earthquake and so on. Um, after that, I made a run for California State Superintendent of Schools, and I wanted to uh, apply the things that I learned and developed in, in Popper Kaiser School uh, more widely, which mainly was the use of computer technology and a bunch of other things, smaller classrooms and so on. And I made a run for California State Superintendent of Schools. I, I came in second. I didn't win. <laughs> uh, Delane Easton won. She was kind of a professional politician, uh, not so much of an educator. And she retained the job for the full two terms uh, that she could have. Uh, but I, I, I needed to get out of, and we've been there for 24 years. We had been running Popper Kaiser School in dingy little Sunday school classrooms at uh, the Methodist Church on California Street in Santa Cruz. And I was really looking for a way out. I was getting older and I thought, you know, I, I, maybe I can get a job in a private uh, school as a, uh, as a headmaster and make some decent money and have a, a better uh, situation. Because at that time, what uh, Tess and I were making was about the equivalent of one salary. And we weren't able to save anything. We were just living from paycheck to paycheck. So I, uh, uh, I accepted uh, a position up in uh, Bellingham, Washington to found a new school that would be called Cornerstone School. Uh, and uh, the things that occurred during that period of time, there's a lot of very interesting things. I also became part of a, a, a very well-known Dixieland band up there in the area that had uh, was featured on, a, on a, a show called North by Northwest and did some playing for that. And I did some recording and so on, played a lot of gigs. And then when that all uh, was over, we came back to Santa Cruz and we founded Popper Kaiser Junior High School. Um, because uh, in my absence, uh, one of the parents and one of the teachers on the board that I, I expanded our board from three to seven, and they had tried to kick us off the board and take over the school and uh, et cetera. And then I had to go through some legal processes to, uh, uh, to stop that. And then we finally made a deal that I would start a new junior high on high school over by the uh, in some facilities that we would uh, we would lease and uh, we would fix up for the kind of education I wanted using laptop computers and things. This is very early on in the 90s. <laughs> and um, so I talk about that whole situation. Um, after 1970, an awful lot of things happened uh, in my music life. I have a whole section on jazz where I talk about who I played with and um, concerts that I did and so on, all the way up to uh, a tour just re very recently uh, in Europe. And I became a, a symphonic band and chamber, chamber orchestra conductor, putting on uh, things like the Messiah sing-along and the Nutcracker ballet 
at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium and different things. So um, that was a whole branch of my life. And then I, my ministry as an independent bishop, which began with meeting Bishop Spruitt when I was at the Academy of Arts and Humanities, uh, resulted in um, my consecration as an independent bishop by Spruitt. Uh, I had collaborations with several other people who were very significant. Uh, Torquem Saradarian, who passed away in the late 80s, uh, was a great uh, soul who uh, was kind of my elder spiritual brother. And I collaborated also with uh, Bishop uh, and Count George Boyer in the United Kingdom and England. We visited a few times and he passed on all kinds of uh, charters and uh, grand masterships and things like that to me that I had not requested, but he had received dreams telling him to do so. And I collaborated with Bishop Rosamund Miller, who is still alive uh, and uh, has her, her Gnostic Center has gone through three uh, evolutions. She's now uh, has a building uh, that they beautifully decorated in Redwood City, not very far from where we live now. My collaboration with uh, Bishop Michael Zaharakis, who is now deceased, there is uh, a, a very interesting information that went with that. He was a very psychic person. With Barbara Marks Hubbard, who is now deceased, who I also consecrated as a bishop, um, and um, uh, in, in Rosamund Miller's uh, second chapel, or maybe it was her first chapel. My collaboration with Bishop Warren Waters, who was a great, wonderful uh, person, who used to be the superintendent of schools in Watsonville um, and lived in Santa Barbara. And we used to visit all the time. And then the events that led up to my founding of the Temple of the Holy Grail, which was a what we call a contacted organization. It was uh, I was given guidance and that I followed and uh, that uh, to uh, to go to a place on the eighth month of the eighth day of the eighth decade uh, of the eighth hour uh, in 1988 in August, on August 8th, to do a special kind of ritual that earned me the spiritual title of Grailmeister, Grailmeister, Grailmaster. So after age 30, uh, I'm continuing with things that were done at that point. Uh, I tell you about uh, how we developed uh, <clears throat> the different empowerments of the uh, Temple of the Holy Grail. Uh, the weather proving, the being able to actually change the weather to make it rain, to make it clear up, etc. All the esoteric lineages I now carry forth as the Grand Master. The stigmata of Hilarion that came to me uh, when I was meditating overnight at the um, uh, at a spiritual center uh, south of uh, San Rui Obispo. Um, known as Halcyon. Uh, the experience with uh, the Golden Dawn and the Cristalli Prima looks where I became um, a uh, was raised into the highest order of, uh, of the Golden Dawn uh, uh, advancements and so on over a couple of years. My collaboration with Eugene Whitworth and Ruth Whitworth, now both deceased. The trip that I took, I had three trips to India. And on one of them, I was, uh, I, it was suggested very strongly by the fellow that, uh, who was the pundit that we had gone with, that I should go and meet this, uh, what was called a, copper plate reader who uh, was guided by a spirit of Achuta, who was a great uh, 
sage in India, uh, a Vedic astrology sage, a Jyotish sage. And these prophecies, you'd sit with the man and they would simply just appear uh, on these copper plates or silver plates. And his prophecy about me and my life and so on, which is there. The, uh, this, the world blessing circum global operation I took upon myself in 2015, where I flew around the world and visited my students worldwide and did workshops and did a special form of blessing as I flew over every land going from, uh, from west to east. Um, circum uh, globally going completely around the earth and doing a world blessing as part of my role as Grail Master to uh, protect the earth and keep it um, keep it from evil forces for the next hundred years and then I'm going to go through all kinds of details about uh, <clears throat> all the bishops that I have consecrated since 1978 when I was consecrated as a bishop. So uh, lots of details about all these people, very interesting people, very qualified people. Uh, and uh, so I have um, a great deal of information about that. And from 1998 to the present, my marriage to Willa and our spiritual work together, the building of the yurt, which became a very important place where I did teaching, not only, uh, it became not only a teaching and, and Eucharistic setting for uh, the, the home temple, but it also became a, a Tibetan Buddhist uh, sanctuary and how our spiritual paths diverged eventually. And the story about the, uh, the, I call it the crazy lady in the yurt. She was actually the, the well, wife, well, they don't really get married, of a great Tibetan Lama who was, had prematurely uh, done a whole lot of practices she shouldn't have done and she wasn't ready for it. And she had become a very powerful black magician. She was very dangerous and she, uh, was asked, Willow was asked by her guru <laughs> to let this woman and her daughter uh, stay in the yurt for the summer so they could study for their, their tests and then go down to New York and stay in the Tibetan Buddhist community there. And the daughter and the mother would take tests so they could become citizens. But that didn't happen. Uh, instead, a whole lot of very crazy and nasty and evil things happened. And I really had to sharpen my skills uh, as a, a power over dark forces <clears throat> to counteract what she was setting up. She was very powerful. And finally, uh, after Will and I had been separated for several years and had separate lives for several years, uh, we went through, uh, I, we agreed to file for divorce. <clears throat> And uh, right after I did that filing, I, uh, I connected with Kat, Kathleen St. Clair. And my story of my marriage, my, my years with Kathleen up to the present time, uh, we didn't think, we thought if we got married, we would lose, she would lose her social security. And that's what we needed in order to travel because that's what we wanted to do. But it turned out, finally, we found out from an IRS uh, official uh, that we could get married and she wouldn't lose it. So in um, 2019, in May, we had our wedding. We got married and uh, after that we we had already made trips to Europe and Mexico and all kinds of places. Um, and um, so we, we went again to uh, through Europe, Spain, different places. Uh, where I had already consecrated a bishop, and then we went to his sanctuary outside of Manchester, England. That was Vernon's uh, 
Marshall Sanctuary. And uh, we uh, went to Barcelona and different places and saw a lot of wonderful art. Went to the home of uh, Monet and uh, the great museums in Paris. And uh, I played jazz in several places, did concerts and a tour. And uh, finally, to the present time, uh, the, uh, the the coming of the COVID-19 uh, plague and our uh, and our, our our sheltering in place and so on. So the only thing I'm going to put a picture up here is of some of my astrophotography that I did because I had I was able to afford really good equipment when I was teaching and I had a good income teaching at a uh, public high school in Campbell, California. And so I was able to get incredible photographs like this that were processed and so on, the Great Orion Nebula and so on. And uh, this is a, a photo of uh, Kat and I at our wedding reception after we were married in Rosamond by Rosamond Miller and uh, uh, in her chapel at, in, in uh, uh, Gnostic Center in Redwood City. And we made the trip to uh, Paris and other places and I performed in a special concert at uh, Clermont Ferrand with my friend Gary Kaiser, no relationship, different spelling. <laughs> with some wonderful and great musicians there as well. And I played also with other musicians in Paris and other places. And uh, now here we are <laughs> with our masks. <laughs> I'm uh, 79 years old. Cat has just turned uh, 70. What is it? 76, I guess. She's four years younger than I am. And uh, we are sheltering in place uh, here in Menlo Park, California, uh, and uh, having plenty of time to do things. And what I, one of the things I've done is prepared all my uh, presentations on the Lewis Kaiser YouTube channel, which is now becoming the place for most of the material that I require for people who study for ordination and consecration with me in the home temple. Uh, that is where I'm putting most of my material now online, free, the U Lewis Kaiser YouTube channel and various playlists and so on, and where I wrote this book. I began this autobiography, spiritual autobiography, in 2012, and I was never able to go very far with it um, and get much of it done until finally we were sheltering in place and and I finished the book, and that's uh, the consequence of that. So uh, this is the story of my Sparks of Gnosis, my spiritual autobiography, all the different pathways and path workings that uh, happened through my life. And so this has just been a, an introduction to that. It's a very long, it's a 222-page book that uh, contains all kinds of details about the experiences I had the visions I had, the dreams I had, the relationships with people I had that guided my, my, my experience and my transformation, my spiritual development and evolution uh, in this life.